Welcome to another in our series of uh, roundtable discussions dealing with the book of Isaiah. I'm Richard Draper, Associate Dean of Religious Education at Brigham Young University. With me are friends from the Department of Ancient Scripture. We have Professor Robert Millett, Professor Ann Madsen, and Professor Vic Ludlow. Good to have you three with us again, and we'll continue where we left off last time. That is to say, let's go to Isaiah chapter 3. Apparently, there is something amiss because Isaiah writes, For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. Ooh, it sounds like they're going to be moving into bad times. Now, this looks famine. like famine. Yeah, yeah, that sort of thing. So what we've got going on here, Bob? What's well, clearly it's Isaiah's predictions, prophecies concerning bad times to come. And he's going to be pretty specific in the sense that the men of the community will either be killed or they will not be taking their place as leaders as they should. They're not leading their families as they ought to. And thus you have a lot of pain in society, especially among the mothers and the children who, who have no, as it were, priesthood leader. Uh, uh, so, guiding them. So we, we actually have here a situation where, m due to wickedness, men are refusing to take upon themselves the, well, it, the it, it's, responsibility it's, of family? It's only too current, I mean, a problem. I mean, fatherless homes in America today is, is one of the great tragedies where, where there are fathers, they just aren't around. Hmm. And, yes. uh, and I think he's speaking of a day where the fathers just aren't around. Either physically uh, they've been killed or spiritually they have abdicated their responsibilities. And, 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 and to make it worse, particularly in their patriarchal society where the elders are the venerated ones, the ones that should be leading out, uh, verse 3, and babes or youth would be another way of translating it. Youth will rule over them. So everything's turned upside down. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be like having teenage gangs terrorizing and basically governing whatever governing yes. you would call it, yes. a society, because the seasoned citizens have refused to take... Re I mean, even in a family uh, here in, in, in verse... Uh, uh, six and seven, and one comes to his brother and says, you've got something, help me out. And he says, no, I've got enough problems, you, you take care. I mean, you'd expect family at least to help each other, but these men are just not willing to do it. Well, and that could also be interpreted that a man takes hold of his brother of the house of his father, someone close to him saying, you have clothing, be thou our ruler, and let thy rule be under thy head. Um, it's like a uh, recent president during the election said, it's the economy, stupid. Whoever's got something, they're the ones that are going to rule. And I think you can look at it in that political sense that we live in a time when people who have something materially rule. That's what happens. And that's what they were trying to have happen here, and they wouldn't do it. Oh, and it's really bad. Look at verse 9. They show their countenance, uh, or the show of their countenance does witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. I mean, ooh, what, what, a, what a castigation. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, well, that's like naming your son Judas. I mean, that, that just isn't a good thing. <laughs> well, and in a culture where virginity and all these things were very high values, to be able to say they just are telling you all the things they're doing that, are, that used to be a value in our society, and now they just shattered on the housetops. And of course, television does that for us today. Oh, doesn't it? Look no. at that language. Yeah. They have rewarded, verse 9, they have rewarded evil unto themselves. And the that's consequences. Exactly. But we ought to, and you ought to represent the women here later in this chapter. I mean, <laughs> he doesn't just talk about the men and abrogating their responsibilities. What does he say about the women? Well, here? well I have something before that. May I, may I say something, Vic? Yeah, sure. go ahead. Would you notice something interesting for our viewers' sake? And I, and I think it's not an obvious thing. In verses 10 and 11, if you're looking at your King James Version, you'll, uh, we'll read it first. Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. I think the unusual thing, if you look carefully at those verses, is how many words are in italics. In a, exactly. Meaning they weren't originally in yeah, the Hebrew text. Yeah, I presume that the, that the translators put them in to Supplied fill out the it. meaning of the, of the right. sentence. Give it a flow. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think you have another translation of, uh, you have a new international version. What, 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 what for example, uh, read your verses 10 and 11. Tell the righteous it will be well with them, 
for they will enjoy the fruit of their deeds. Woe to the wicked, disaster is upon them. They will be paid back for what their hands have done. This is so typically juxtaposition of Isaiah. He does this all the time. He puts the good next to the bad so you can look at it up close and make some kind of decision about your own actions. Excuse me, Victor. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I, no. No. I was just going to say the juxtaposition makes the, the contrast all the, yes. all the more glaring yeah, in these absolutely. things. So, and, yeah, go ahead. and then there's some complementary patterns he uses where, uh, as we were just getting into, where he talks about the women, I mean the men, excuse me, first of all, and then he's not going to just leave it there. He's going to also have problem. things to say about the women. Okay, I'm very excited to talk about this because <laughs> I think everybody that looks at this, if you're a woman especially, you look at it and you think, Wow, the women of Zion are haughty and walking along and flirting as they go and doing all these terrible things. And they're dressed in all of this stuff. Incidentally, I think we're going to have a graphic to show the kinds of things these were because in the King James Version, how many people know what a crisping pin is? This yeah. is sometimes when you stop reading Isaiah is when you say, I don't understand any of that. But we have some up-to-date things for you to look at about that. As well as, as well as some of the notes at the bottom of the page. Oh, like, yes. Like you said, these are especially valuable because I remember thinking, I have a feeling for what mincing as they go means. But as, <laughs> I, but as I looked down and read what the note said, I said, ah. Read the note for us. Well, mincing as they go would be 16C, uh, or excuse me, E, walking with short, rapid steps in an affected manner. And in those ancient <laughs> times, they actually wore ankle bracelets that had little bells on them uh, so that their husbands or whoever was in charge of them, their fathers, their brothers, their lovers, would, would know where they were. They could tell where they were from the sound that they made. Uh, I, I think what, I guess what I want to say about this is that for me, this is not just the women of this society any more than the men that we were talking about is just the men of the society. When it says the virgin daughter of Zion, it also talks about the virgin daughter of Babylon. And later on, he's going to talk about the virgin daughter of Tyre. There are going to be all these different people. Well, this is one of those times that I think we need to let the metaphor speak to us. It's a metaphor for the time. Women are a perfect um, object to show when they begin to uh, laden their bodies with special silks and designer jewelry. clothes and lots of jewelry. And yeah. um, they had nose rings, which will, are mentioned here. They wore veils as well. And a woman who wore a veil was considered a virgin and was considered honorable. And a woman who was not honorable was not allowed to wear a veil. These women were wearing veils. And they shouldn't have been because they were not. So there was a mockery there. So, and as it goes on, it talks about what I think describes, and I think it's the people in general that are being described here. And I don't think it's just because I'm a woman. It may have some bearing on it. A likely story. Yes. yes. <laughs> anyway, instead of fragrance, it says in verse 24, and I'm reading again in the NIV because it uses the words, uh, instead of fragrance, there will be a stench. Instead of perfume, then, you're going to smell. Instead of a sash, a rope. Instead of well-dressed hair, baldness. Baldness was uh, a characteristic of a slave. And so we're talking about a princess versus a slave. Instead of fine clothing, sackcloth. Instead of beauty, branding. And slaves were branded. Your men will fall by the sword, your warriors in battle, the gates of Zion will lament and mourn. Destitute, she will sit on the ground. In that day, seven women will take hold of one man and say, we will eat our own food and provide our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name. Take away our disgrace. So you see that we read cross into a cross into chapter 4. Isaiah was written in one long line. There are no paragraphs there in Hebrew, they're just... Not even sentences. Not <laughs> sentences. In fact, there are for, some breaks. If we must have breaks, four, one actually belongs at the tail end of three. That's right. right. Yeah, That's the right. consequence. The, the more yeah. natural break will come at the between four and five, right. not between three right. and four. And you find natural breaks. I don't mean that. But I think as you at home are reading Isaiah, 
forget about the chapter breaks. Just keep reading along the chapter and, uh, and see if it isn't. I think chapters 10 and 11 do this amazingly. At the end of chapter 10, it talks about and all of these uh, huge trees will be cut down. They'll all be cut down. There'll be nothing but stumps left. And how does chapter 11 begin? Out of the root shall come a branch. Yeah, <laughs> out of the root of Jesse will come a, a branch. Yeah. And so out of all, one of these stumps is going to come a branch. Well, Bob, let's, uh, I think Anne's point uh, is very well made, and that is that uh, though the imagery is the women, the, the reality is the society. Right, we're, we're yeah. talking about the whole group. That's so. my vote. Yeah, that's very good. <laughs> but Bob, let's go back to, uh, to your point now. I was saying, uh, though, though I think I really agree with what Anne is saying, I think it is a, it is a, it is, and boy, it's so hard to say this without sounding either condescending or patronizing, but, and, and, I, and I mean no double standard by this, but it, is a, but it is a sad dilemma. It is a sad situation to find yourself where you have a society where virtue and chastity and goodness no longer yeah, and fidelity. Are, uh, and fidelity are no longer upheld by the women of the community. You expect women to be better. And, and again, Thank you for I, I, I would have people, to be better. I would have people that will say, oh, you're I'm not trying to. I'm trying to say I have a feel for why, especially in that society, as Victor said, this would have been a terrible thing for a society to witness uh, in a patriarchal society for women to to uh, leave their their position of prominence, to leave their position of beauty, and to and to and to become a mockery to the covenant and worldly. You know? They were protected by the men in their society up yeah. till this time, yeah. and now they're no longer protected in the same way. Their virtue was protected. It was important. I mean, we know that from the story of Dina and her brothers. Her brothers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, all right, let's, I think we better move ahead. Let's go over to chapter four then. That uh, is a happy setting. That is to say, we've now got uh, something uh, to look forward to. Verse two, and in that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and, the, and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. Vic, pick up on that one. What, what we got going on here? Well, we do finally, out of this chaos and worldliness and all of these other things of chapter three, we, we finally end up with something positive coming forth, uh, a generation of people that are willing to assume responsibility to be covenant people, to be a part of Zion. Uh, it culminates uh, with a washing cleansing aspect in verse four, and then kind of the capstone of it is in verses five and six, where every dwelling place of Mount Zion and her assemblies, a cloud and smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night. It reminds us of the tabernacle and the presence of the Lord. I mean, here are his people. For there shall be a tabernacle, you see. I mean, so they've got temples, they've got the, the, an obvious physical symbol of the, of the Lord's presence with them as a Zion people. It's, it's what it reminds me of, Vic, in the sense of I mean, how glorious will be the day when, as President Hunter commissioned us a while back, to make the temple the great symbol of the membership of our church, membership in the church. Uh, when, when we reach the point where our homes become temple-like, yes. where, where as it were, as it was in ancient times with the ancient tabernacle, the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night, that is, the constant, the, the Shekinah, the, the, the presence of God in our midst, you know, and so I think it's speaking of a glorious day when the people, and what is the reason? They'll be holy. Mm -hmm. The people will be a holy people. Yes. Contrast that with the haughtiness of the daughters of Zion yes. before which has caused exactly. the problem. And, and uh, the Hebrew uh, word uh, translated haughty uh, goes beyond, that is to say, the nuance there, uh, we see the pride. The Hebrew is, is not only to exhibit the pride, but it actually describes the, the forceful, obvious looking down on those that are felt to be below us, mm -hmm. okay? The and then that need to be lifted, lifted up. up. Yeah, exactly right, yeah, and, and nobody's right. doing it. And so we move, move from that then to this day when the branch shall be beautiful and good and so on. Mm -hmm. And I, one of the early brethren, I was trying to think who it was, maybe Orson Pratt, maybe Parley P. Pratt, my husband would know, but I don't, and said, he quoted this, and then he said, that day will come in this valley, meaning the Salt Lake Valley, 
that on every home there will be a cloud and a fire and that you know he really pinned it down to our personal dwellings you know I think that's what that's what the brethren try to talk to us about that the temple is not that the, you don't that leave as sacred it there. as the simple temple is truly the holiest place on earth should be the individual home and we learn in the temple how to make our homes holy we mm -hmm. do we learn about prayer we learn about all the things that can make our homes holy and that we need to keep out the dirt and the scum and all of the yeah, things yeah, exactly that, right. that come. Well, like unfortunately, uh, we as in everything on. else, yeah, and not only that, we, we go from this beautiful setting in chapter four, and what do we get into chapter five? Well, a poem. Anne, would you like to uh, pick up on the poem and just read yeah, a little bit this of that? Is, this is wonderful. This is a parable right in the middle of the Old Testament, I think, most would say there are no parables in the Old Testament, and here is one. Yeah, it's Isaiah's only major parable. Yes. <laughs> and, of course, Christ used parables all the time. He told stories. And now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved, touching his vineyard. I love the words beloved mm -hmm. over tender, and over again. It? it is so tender. The Book of Mormon is full of it. The end of the Book of Mormon, Mormon is calling the Lamanites beloved and they're trying to kill him and here we are my well beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill and he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof which there are many of in the land of <laughs> Judah and I mean you'd have to gather out the stones before you could plant a vineyard and planted it with the choicest vine not just anything and built a tower in the midst of it. And of course the tower is built so that it can be guarded in, uh, during the harvest especially. Um, and also made a wine press therein with great faith that there was really going to be a wonderful harvest. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and then it turned sour. <laughs> and it brought forth wild grapes. And mm -hmm. now, oh, and, and we need to know that grapes have different sweetnesses, and in Israel particularly. I remember when we did this at the Jerusalem Center, we could use some grapes and it would be sweet. I mean, it really, re so sweet you thought they'd put sugar in it. And you could use other grapes and it would be almost sour. So he was looking for it to bring forth good grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. And this, I think, is one of the most tender cries that gives you an insight into God, our Father. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? You know, he promises us our agency. It's eternal. We've got to have agency. Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes, and now go to, I will tell you what I will do with my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, meaning that there'll be briars and thistles and noxious weeds, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down, and I will lay it waste, and it shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain, no rain upon it. Now, only God could do that part. Yeah, and, and, and this has got to be a situation where his listeners all of a sudden realize, now, wait Ooh, a minute. Yeah. What, what is Isaiah doing here? This, technically, this is called an entrapment parable. It is. Where he's he setting them, them up. The they don't in. realize it. They're already making judgments. Oh, you couldn't have done anything more for your vineyard. You've done everything possible. <laughs> yeah. Boy, he's mad here. Look at all these <laughs> things he's doing. But as soon as he goes to and command the clouds, they rain, no rain upon it. You know, farmers would like to be able to control control the weather, can't. but they can't. <laughs> and all of a good. sudden they're thinking, now wait a minute, what is he really saying? And then immediately at that point he stops the parable, really, mm -hmm. explains yeah, and, and, and gives them the meaning. For, he goes on here to say, verse 7, the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Judah. 
Israel. And ye men of, of the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plan. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry. Now in the Hebrew, he uses some contrasting words here. Yes. It'd be like in English saying he was looking for righteousness and he got riotousness. Yes, yeah. which is a good way to say that. Uh, which, if you're not listening carefully, it sounds like he said the same thing twice, but actually they're poles apart. Richard, I, 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 maybe I'm going on a, out on a limb here, but I don't think so. I mean, the language is too familiar to me, to, uh, to all of us, I think. Uh, it seems to me that Isaiah just really has to be drawing upon Zenos here. Th th this, is, oh, this, is, uh -huh. this, is, this is too Zenos-like, <laughs> too the same, the same kind of language. What could have been done more to my vineyard? Yeah. It's so easy to remember, too. Jacob 5, yeah. Isaiah 5. Jacob 5, there Isaiah 5. It, mm -hmm. He just seems to be drawing upon that great, great uh, Jacob chapter 5 in the Book of Mormon, trying to teach us this lesson of Jacob 5 and 6 that God simply will not let Israel go. He just mm -hmm. won't let her go. He's going to keep. Mm -hmm. He's going to yeah. keep trying. And then he builds upon it here, where just as the Lord had put forth all this effort, time, resources, energy, hope, expectation, and he got bitterness instead of sweetness, then he goes through a whole shopping list. Uh -huh. Okay, here are some things that you think are going to bring you happiness. Yeah. Possessions, uh, power, uh, popularity, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things yeah. that you think are going to bring, bring you happiness, you're going to put time, money, energy. It's going to end up bringing you emptiness, hollowness. And one of the passages that have, I've noticed in the last few years have been quoted extensively at conference and was again uh, uh, just last week is verse 20. Uh, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Just how unfortunate it is in so much of our modern media and music that the heroes are immoral, they're taking advantage of other people, and they just, they're getting everything turned around. It becomes incumbent, you know, upon parents and grandparents to teach and teach and teach their children where to look for their cues on values. That mm -hmm. is, we don't go to Hollywood, we don't go to television, mm -hmm. we don't go to this magazine or that magazine. Or I started to name, or we don't go to the internet. We look to the Lord, we look to the scriptures, we look to the prophets in order to get our values straight. And, 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 and I remember so well Elder Oaks years ago at a BYU devotional indicating that when he was a child, his widowed mother always taught the children, children, always pray about your feelings. Pray yeah. about your feelings. And that becomes so critical because what we want to feel is what the Lord wants us to feel. Mm -hmm. I mean, I want to have the discernment to tell this is wrong. I don't care, I don't care how many millions of people are in favor of it, it's wrong. This mm -hmm. is a right course. It's, it's like Elder Eyring in a recent conference said, I want to do what you want me to do. That's yeah. a wonderful prayer for children to mm -hmm. learn. You know, we may not be able to teach them to say, Thy will be done because that's kind of something they may not have their a handle on. But I want to do what you want me to do, Lord. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just, oh. I think this is so scary when you read verse 20 because it's so current. It is. You don't it's have to. Time. You don't have to go very far to see it. It's in our society, and we just don't look to society. Uh, I can still remember that magnificent talk President Kimball gave in the 80s at BYU, Absolute Truth, mm -hmm. yes. where he said, it doesn't matter if every single person on this earth said this is right, God said it's wrong, and that's all we need. Mm -hmm. and that's a great standard. Now, can we get anything good out of this chapter here? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, yes. the good stuff is coming. I mean, look at verse 26. There, there, there's the coming of the ensign to the nations. That's, uh, that's a slogan. That's a, that's, that, that goes ding, ding, ding in my mind when I see that phrase yes. because that says, says for me, restoration of the gospel. And banners mm -hmm. and missionary work. That's right. And I mean, look, yes. they come with speed swiftly. I love this. We don't have time to read all the verses there, but... When you think, we just went through a general conference, when you think of people coming out from all over the world, gathering, as it were, to, to the center place for conference, they didn't take their shoes off, they didn't, many of them probably left their coat on, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, they gathered swiftly. And how did they get there? Powerfully. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know whether he saw a train or a plane or what, but clearly he saw something 
that powerfully and quickly moves them to the spot of gathering. With roars and whirlwinds God, and all of this was, in this descriptive language here is powerful. He was so impressed that they didn't even have to break a, a sandal, <laughs> so, yeah. you know? And, and he couldn't, I mean, Isaiah can't say, behold, thus cometh the 747. No. no. But, <laughs> but he could say, boy, they travel so swiftly, they gather to the place without even taking their cloak off or un and, and well their shoes. And well-rested and, and yeah. not worn out when yeah. they arrived. Yeah. Well, well uh, go ahead and make your point. I was just going to uh, come back to you, Anne, as a matter of fact, and say, okay, so as we take a look at this, and what do we see? What, what is the message? What, what can we take home with us? Well, we've talked about the, you know, juxtapositioning. Uh, Isaiah does this over and over again, telling us, this is what's happening. This is, I'm describing to you your lives right now. And in a sense, he's doing that to us as well. He's I mean, Isaiah is written for our time and he's describing to us our lives. Uh, calling evil good and good evil is so uh, amazing when you think of that because that is our time. We could give a myriad of examples. <laughs> But then when he says he will lift up an ensign to the nations from far, and, and the idea of missionaries going out. And for me, I interpret these last few verses, and I think I'd like to just read them, as the, the kind of hyperbole that you find in the Old Testament, talking about the things they knew, lions. I mean, picture in your mind. Let the metaphor speak to you. This the roaring shall be though. like a, a lion. They shall roar like young lions. Yea, they shall roar and lay hold of the prey. You know, this is missionaries who are unafraid to teach mm -hmm. the gospel. And in that day, they shall roar against them like the roaring of the sea. Let that metaphor speak to you. You can do that. You've just been out there in the middle of the sea. And if one look unto the Lord, behold, I mean the land, behold darkness and sorrow and the light is darkened in the heavens thereof. But in reality, the joy of the ensign, the knowing good from evil, that's what this is about. And yes. in our day, we do that, we hope. Yes. yes, very good. Well, thank you once again. It's been a joy to be with you. For more information on this program, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org.